co-host of the Writers Haven Show and the podcast hashtag Literally Speaking. This is V Helena with a super exciting show for you today. We are mixing it up a little different with this interview because our guest is joining us via video conferencing as he prepares for the production of his play Mother Road at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. My guest is author, playwright, and director Octavio, I said it wrong. Octavio, Octavio. Octavio Solis. That's lovely. Octavio is an accomplished playwright and director who has written over 25 plays. Most wow. notably, his works include Lydia, Santos and Santos, and Man of the Flesh. His plays have won numerous awards, including the Penn Carter Award for Drama, the Distinguished Achievement in the American Theater Award, the Bay Area Critics Circle Mid-Career Achievement Award, and many, many others. His contributions to Latino theater are immeasurable. And not only is he noted to be one of the most prominent Latino playwrights in America, he's considered to be a beacon in sharing authentic stories wow. that are relatable to that community. Oh, thank you very much. That's lovely. <laughs> I'm not done, I'm not done. In 2018, Octa Octavio penned his first book, Retablos, Stories from a Life Lived Along the Border. That is a wonderful memoir of childhood and coming of age experiences that gets to the heart of the human experience in living on the Mexican border. Fresh off the press, we just learned he was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters on his literary achievements. We're going to talk about these accomplishments and more. So without further ado, Join me in welcoming Octavio Solis to the show. And I know I murdered your Thank name. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. Be here. Yeah. It's my pleasure to be on here to help and talk and, and, uh, and uh, mix it up with yeah. other writers. Yeah, we're, we're very, very happy to have you here. And I want to start off talking about your play, Mother Road. It premiered yes. last year at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and makes an appearance here in D.C. at Arena Stage between February 7th and March 8th. Tell us about the play and why it was important to write the story for the stage. Um, I went on a journey with people from the Steinbeck Center, National Steinbeck Center in Salinas, um, that began in Salazar, Oklahoma, and we followed the journey of the Jode family, the fictional Jode family from the Grapes of Wrath, yeah. Um, and we collected stories, oral histories all along the way. Um, myself, the staff from the, uh, from the Steinbeck Center, two other artists and a film crew. So it was quite a journey to caravan uh, in three vehicles uh, over 12 days and doing multiple stops and getting all these wonderful stories. And we were asked to produce something uh, uh, that we would present at the following year's uh, Steinbeck Festival. And I did not know what to write about. Um, but I read the book before and read it again during this journey. Mm -hmm. So it was really fascinating seeing this uh, portrait of America on the, from, from the perspective of the road that was in Steinbeck's novel, written in 1939 or something like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then seeing it, seeing it live passing, streaming by. So it was having the juxtaposition really kind of gave me a sense of how far we've come as a nation, as a people, and, and how much further we have to go. And really how, in many cases, things haven't changed at all. Yeah. Um, then uh, when we arrived at our final stop in Arvin, California, the Arvin Migrant Camp, which is um, an actual camp that's, that's in the novel as well, the first federally san sanctioned migrant camp um, built specifically to house all these people that were coming from that, that uh, farm belt uh, who were in dire need and just want to work. Um, well, we met uh, a gentleman there who really wanted to talk to me, a young man me of Mexican descent like myself who had grown up there. He and his mother were part of the Pisca, that is the harvest traveling from field to field, place to place, um, working the fields, picking. And 
And uh, he told me that the camp is still in existence, but all the workers now are Mexican. They've come from Mexico. They come on visas to work. They travel up and down the San Joaquin, all over the Central Valley to work. But he told me something that I found really extraordinary. He said uh, that that book was very special to him. He knew it and he could recite passages by heart and he recited some of them for us. And he told me something remarkable. He said, I am the new Tom Joad. Mm. And we, us Mexicans, we are the new Okies. So for me, the novel is about us. The novel tells our story and, 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 and it serves, the Okies serve not just as, as a, a point of history of, peop of people, mm. of certain people that underwent such discrimination and such troubles mm. during that time, but they're a metaphor for us as well, yeah. because we're being targeted that way today. And when, when he told me that, I knew exactly what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to tell the story of a descendant of Tom Joad, who happened to be Mexican, who is now in line to inherit a large farm in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. but is meeting resistance from the only man who, who exists in Oklahoma, who was also a Joad, so they're related, but he just can't accept that a Mexican would own this land or deserves a land. Yeah. And so they have to take a road trip together back along that mother road, what, which is what John Steinbeck called Route 66, mm -hmm. uh, all the way back to Salazar. And there they have to they have to deal with their prejudices, with their biases, with their slanted views on America and, uh, and, and sort of discover each other's compassion, each other's understanding and humanity. And so I feel like they're on, they're on the pisca themselves, but uh, it's for the American soul. They're out there picking the, the elements that they're going to bring on this ride the, picking the new family members in order to build a new family that's going to be there in Salazar when they arrive. So uh, I, I feel, uh, and as I started writing it, I felt like I, like I was making a kind of uh, commentary on what's happening in our society mm -hmm. and how we need to um, bridge that with, with real compassion and real listening to really hear each other. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this play serves that. Wow, that's an incredible story. Um, and, and because of your prominence in the Latino community and from your being from the perspective, coming from the perspective as a writer of whether it's literature or, or stage, did you feel some urgency and a responsibility to really tell that story with a level of authenticity to a broad range of audience so that it can help people to see how life is from another perspective? Yes, I really did. You did you go into the project thinking that? Um, I couldn't help but do that. Um, before, you know, I'm writing mainly for myself. I'm writing out of this need to just exercise these ghosts that are, that are crawling around inside of me, that mm -hmm. are uh, clamoring for some voice and, some, and some, uh, some presence. So often my plays are about that, just write it out, write these stories out and, and do it for myself and hopefully there'll be an audience for that. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, um, I felt a greater responsibility because I was also carrying John Steinbeck's ghost inside of me as I was writing it. Yeah. And John Steinbeck is a model for so many, not mm -hmm. just writers, but for so many people because he wrote uh, from that place of honesty, from that place of, uh, uh, from his own sense of activism, yeah. from, his own, from his own urgent need to, to depict peoples who are often uh, on the fringes of our society. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I felt, I, felt him, I felt him inside of me and I, I said, I have to do this right. And I, and, I, and I have to make sure that people's voices are respected and presented in a way that feels authentic and true. And that I'm not saying anything that's, go, that, that's, that's going to feel um, 
uh, wrong. But, you know, but I'm only one person. I'm only one writer. So that's why I need a director and actors to help me flesh that out, to kind of call me on, on <laughs> call me on shit. Right, when right. I, when, when I don't get it right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I need them. And they do. And they help me. Um, and so, you know, this is what being a playwright's about. It's about being, being, having the, the humility and the confidence, honestly, yeah. to be able to feel good enough about your work that you can open it up and say, what's working, what's not? Right. Help me understand this. Uh, because I know that their ultimate purpose is to make my vision true, my vision really, make it really uh, work on stage. Um, and still, um, you know, they're they're smart about like you know saying you know if a character is racist don't hedge around it don't apologize for it present it because um because we're ready to depict it we're ready to play that but but if you start sort of slightly apologizing for it in one way uh it makes us all self-conscious it makes the audience self-conscious yeah that's true that's so, very true so you know there's a lot of people that are like in, in my play, eventually, there are a lot of people that are just truth telling, that are just uh, saying what they feel and what they think, even if it's wrong, uh, because that's where we start. Yeah. The place to understand someone is to misunderstand them first. Mm. You have to get it wrong first in order to know what to get right, where yes. to go right. And then also have the humility to then take a step back coming from the knowledge of, you know, I didn't get that right. And being uh, able to own that and then to yeah. do something different. Yeah. Because that seems to be the part that people have a hard time getting to. Yeah. And, uh, and of course I want to get it right because if I don't, it's out there in the world mm -hmm. and it's being performed in that way. And at some point there's going to be nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And so it's important to, to try to get it right. Um, at the same time, I have to reflect the mores that exist now. Um, mores and people will change. Trends will come and go and, and, and people will have uh, new ideas. Um, so, you know, every work will date itself. Um, but at the same time, there are those things that will hold true from one era to another era, a hundred years from now, 500 years from now. And those are the things that I call the verities, uh, courage, love, the truth, virtue. Mm -hmm. um, these, these are the elements that we have to, that I have to be honest about how I depict them. Because yeah. that's what's going to carry the work into the 21st and the 22nd century and beyond. What, what does it feel like to actually see the performance of something that you created? Well, it's, um, I, think of, I think it's a miracle. I think it's a real miracle, especially if I haven't seen the work in a while and someone says, come see this play of yours that we, you wrote and produced 10 years ago or whenever, <laughs> and, and I'll go see it. And, and I just think, did I write that? Did I really write that? Um, it's really kind of strange to find this document being given life and breath and energy by actors. Mm -hmm. And the words are, 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 they feel like they were written by someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I marvel at it all the time. I, 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 I go, who the heck wrote that line? <laughs> what was, and if I did it, what was I thinking? <laughs> and, and, you know, I can't touch it. I can't change it because that plays a document of who I was, what I believed, what I thought at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to stay somewhat pure in that way. Mm -hmm. I could re end up rewriting the play over and over and over and over again to kind of suit who I am now and mm -hmm. how accomplished as a writer I am now. Yeah. But, uh, but to present a play in that, in that form that, uh, as, as in the way I believe 20 years ago, 30 years ago and see it now, it just, I, I think it's important to kind of keep it in that way mm -hmm. because then I can track how I have grown 
I can track the evolution of my ideas because the, the play I write the 10 years from now will be so different from this one. Yeah. And in fact, I, I work very hard to throw out the clay that I used for, for Mother Road mm -hmm. to, so that I can bring new materials to find new structures and new ways of, of uh, expression mm -hmm. for the next play. Right. So right. I'm not repeating myself. Okay. Um, is it Don Quixote that's going to France? Yes. No, actually, no. And that's not, that's Retablos. Okay. Um, there's a production of, uh, I have this book called Retablos. Yes, we're going to talk I, about that too. <laughs> and, uh, and it was written in 2018 uh, and was, was released uh, in October of that year. And there's a company called Word for Word in San Francisco that I have directed before. Uh, for whom I've directed and they what they do is they don't work with playwrights they work with authors they mm -hmm. find excellent short fiction or a chapter from a novel that that uh, a novel they've all read and love and want to somehow present to the stage and um, and they'll do it and just as the name of the group implies they do it word for word uh -huh. they don't cut anything out they don't adapt it they don't shape it, they don't uh, abridge it in any way whatsoever. And they keep in all the he says and she says and find this amazing way to stage these works mm -hmm. that really makes the literature just jump up like a, like a pop-up book on the stage. <laughs> and, uh, and authors, when they attend their, their, their performances, they're always beaming at the end of it because nothing of their work has been has been adulterated in any way mm -hmm. and they get to see it performed before a live audience mm -hmm. and and in in a glorious way too are they doing the whole book or a certain they're doing selections actors because i have my yeah. favorites oh. i did a crash course <laughs> on octavio octavio solis and my favorites was um ben uh the one about the 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 man who was the jew that was coming to collect the money yes the fight yes <laughs> um oh and the two birds at the beginning oh yeah that that was uh, that the way that came about the the very first one is i started writing these just out of the blue uh one one evening when i was kind of log jammed in my in my plays, I just couldn't write anymore on my plays. I was, I was at writer's block. Mm -hmm. So I decided to just jot these, these little memories, this one memory I had down, because it seemed so surreal and I was convinced that it didn't happen, mm. but, but I know it did. Uh, so I wrote it down so it, I would remember it. And it read like a story, like a really curious story. So I started sh cutting it shorter and shorter shaping it, trying to make it sh um, uh, like, almost like flash fiction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I liked it and I just shelved it and put it in a folder and I would write like one a month every now and then. So then they started coming twice a month and pretty soon at the end I was writing almost mm -hmm. one a day. So staying on Retablos, um, uh, you just gave us the journey of how it came to be. Yes. Um, but why was it important important for you to write? I know they were there were memories that you wanted to make sure that you didn't forget. Um, but was the timing of the writing of them because these are memories that you've had since you were a, a little boy. Um, but then you decided in 2010 to start writing them down. Was there something unique about the timing of that writing, of starting that journey? I, I, I think there was. I think it's connected to the fact that my daughter was growing up mm -hmm. and uh, she was going, becoming an adult and was already separating from us and wanted her own place and she had her own tastes. And, you know, she's very close to us, to my wife and I. But I felt like, you know, she's finally really, truly growing up and I'm losing her. And, uh, and I, th I felt something change in me at that point. Uh, I, I had I'd been 
this angry man for many, many years. I, I don't project that, and everybody thinks I'm really nice, but <laughs> inside I carry a lot of anger. And I think I started to let it go. And I started to let it go uh, by, uh, by writing out these, these rites of passage, mm -hmm. the kind, writing out the incidents that made me who I am. Um, and I guess like they, can, they go on forever because we're always changing. And, uh, and particularly the, the stories that have to do with my family, with my father or my brother, you know, they're, uh, the, some of them are very hard, um, but I, I revisit them because now I know that, uh, that, they're, that they're very different people uh, still. And I'm different myself. Yeah. And in fact, I'm different every time I read the story because you don't step into the same river twice. Wow. So the stories are, without changing a word, every time I read the story, and I've done numerous readings of them at bookstores, mm -hmm. um, the stories tell me something different every time. Mm. I learn something different about my father, about my mother, about the upbringing I had, about myself as a Mexican-American, about what it means to be uh, an artist, a writer. Um, so I, I did them purely for me. I felt like I did them for me. Uh, but in, when I started working on the stories to really craft them into some kind of story, I said, ultimately, they can't be about me. Yeah. Once you share them with the world, they have to say something to the world. Uh, they, they have to belong to the world. And I thought, well, maybe it's for the people that grew up in my generation. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll, it's really for them. They'll get it. But I'm finding that people, who, young people today, yes. are accessing them and finding things that they relate to. I would and say you, so, yeah. Definitely. And you, don't, and you don't have to be lat Latino or Latina right. to, to relate to it either. Right. Uh, we're all kind of immigrants right. in our own world in some respect. We yes. all come from somewhere else. And we come in as strangers. And, and, and we have to negotiate uh, this strange world and learn its rules and violate its rules in order to to figure out who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Retablos is about. Um, so how different is it in writing for the stage versus writing literature? Or is oh, it Oh, wow. There, there's a big difference. It's a really big difference. In, uh, in theater, um, the thing that seems seems to be the, the, ground, the grounding thing is that it's action. There's always a forward movement, a forward action. Things can never be in stasis. The world can never sit still to try to, you know, gain mercy or, or, or win the lottery or, you know, they're after something. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so they're never at rest. The play is never at rest. If, if, if it stops, that's usually a place where um, a director will go and pinpoint and go, What's, what's the scene about? What's happening here? And um, uh, even if it's simply a character listening or, or learning something uh, or watching and, and, and acquiring information that they'll be able to use later, that's still an action. Um, stories are very different. The stories, especially my stories, uh, I can indulge in the language. I can indulge in the poetry a little more. I can sit still and present uh, a, a story simply almost as a character study, like the story of Consuelo. Uh, all, all I, I start out with her that she, I see her and she's got something hidden, something, some special talisman in her hand. And then I just create this portrait of her, a thumbnail sketch of her, if you will. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, I go back and I see, oh, what, what does she have in her hand? Oh, it's an apple, an apple we threw away that she's now gingerly taking bites of. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's real hard to de depict that on stage because there's always some impetus to want to make the character be about action moving forward. Um, so that's the, that's the chief difference mm -hmm. is that I felt like I could really let my, my love of language go. Tell me really quick what advice you would give to a young playwright who's looking to get into this art form. Just really quick, two seconds. Really quick, really quick. Uh, 
if, especially if they're going to get into theater, write your plays, write your plays, write your plays. Don't stop to, especially when you're just starting out, don't stop to examine and criticize what you're doing. Don't be afraid to be bad. Don't be excellent. Just tell the truth. Work on that. Don't try to be excellent because if you start trying to be excellent, you'll never get very far. Uh, you can always in the second draft clean up, clean up and perfect your sentences, cut, edit, shape. That's what, that's what the craft is about. That's what the second, third, fourth, up to the 20th draft. That's what that's about. Mm -hmm. But in the first draft, it should be ugly. It should be messy. I've written in my first draft, the, the main character's name changes three times. And I don't go back and correct it until I figure out, is that third time the right name of that character? Yeah. So I allow myself, give myself permission to be bad in order to just get the story out first, get it all out. Um, and then the other piece of advice is, if, if you can't find anyone to stage your play, to produce your play, mm -hmm. do it yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. I was working in a punk club in Dallas, Texas, and when I couldn't get my plays done, I did them there. Mm -hmm. I directed them myself. I paid actors out of my pocket, even $10, $15. They would work for peanuts uh, just to be able to be on stage in the club and perform. Wow. And then, and then people came and saw that and said, oh, will you write a play for us? So you got to start somewhere. And if, and if you can't get noticed, find ways to make yourself make your art happen for yourself yeah thank you so so very much for joining thank you Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org.